a pelvis a woman has to assess how difficult birth is going to be. Usually women around 50% tend to have the gynecoid. One, uh, some women do have android, it's not really common, but those who do have a little bit of a harder time uh, giving birth because of basically the difference in shapes. This is a little bit like larger. And anthropoid is larger basically anthroposteriorly, so it's still fine. Um, although less common, and platypaloid as well. So Android is the one that is going to give you most difficulties during birth. And basically, traditionally, uh, they like to think of pelvic shapes as male and female and give them different characteristics. Uh, obviously, there's variations, but for exam purposes, basically the male one are thick and heavy and deep and whatever, and the females are thin and light and shallow. So all the traditional uh, adjectives that you can think of, you can apply them to pelvic shapes, how convenient. Uh, so in terms of ligaments, uh, the very important ones are the sacrotuberous ligament, sacrospinous, and obturator membrane, because those create those anatomical spaces that are gonna be important for you to identify different kinds of structure and create different types of like foramina. So the very important ones are the greater sciatic foramen, lesser sciatic and obturator foramen. And here are some of the structures that go through them. Those I would highly recommend to learn. Those ones are the, a little bit less relevant, but still very important. Like, I think I remember having a question on basically what structures would go through the supraperiform foramen. foramen excuse my pronunciation, um, but pretty much, basically, it's quite easy to remember because you've got superior gluteal nerve in the superpiriform and then everything else in the infrapiriform foramen. So that's pretty much how you can remember that. Let me know if I'm going too fast. We can go over more things. So the overview, basically, make sure that you know, um, um, basically, uh, what structures make up the lesser pelvis and the greater pelvis and the difference between pelvic outlet and pelvic brim um, and basically the contents so kind of the boundaries and all those kind of like anatomical boundaries that help you understanding what spaces are which so in terms of contents uh, we've got the terminal part of the ureters bladder rectum all the pelvic reprodu reproductive organs and uh, uh, basically overflow of some abdominal viscera so basically small loops of bowel and yeah, so piriform and, uh, piriformis and obturator inter internus being some of the muscles that create those boundaries. Um, so on, as I mentioned before, there is a clinical application to knowing all this stuff about the pelvis that seems quite irrelevant. And that, seems, uh, that is basically understanding the obstetric conjugate and the diagonal conjugate, and that's gonna help you pretty much with uh, assessing the difficulty of birth. Um, Again, I doubt they're gonna give you like a question on assessing how difficult it is for a patient to give birth. So don't worry about that. Just worry about the kind of like understanding uh, the shapes and remembering the boundaries. In terms of muscles, we've got a bunch. So those are mostly like, um, so puberectalis, coccygeus, uh, and iliac cox coccygeus, oh my God, I'm terrible at pronouncing this, uh, basically are some of the important ones, but the levator ani, which is made of puberectalis, pubococcygeus, and iliococcygeus are uh, pretty much very important. It, is a, it has a tendinous uh, arch here and it merges with the obturator fascia. This is something that they really like to assess you on. Um, so this is important because uh, of incontinence. So there are gonna be patients where for whatever reason, but usually because of childbirth, they're gonna have uh, injuries to either those muscles or to the nerves supplying those muscles. And basically they might have fecal continence, uh, urinary continence, or both, yay. So uh, pretty much um, that is the relevance of it. So the pre-rectal fibers of the puborectalis muscles also basically go around the external urethral sphincter. So that's why it also contributes to urinary continence. Um, and basically a good way to remember what um, innervation that kind of area has is the pudendal nerve, just like the diaphragm, but for the part, down, like down part of the body. So pretty much S2, S3, S4 keeps the shit off the floor. Easy peasy to remember. 
So um, to avoid that incontinence, usually in a surgical setting, you try to pre like prevent that and do the incision yourself. If you, if you see that there's gonna be a little bit of pressure on that area and that the perineum might literally explode, what you might do is that you do a cut yourself so that you know where you're cutting and you know what, in so what structures not to injure or not. And that operation is called an episiotomy. So the vasculature of this area is basically usually, like, it all comes from the iliac artery and it can be divided in posterior and anterior division to help you remember. So all these things in blue are the anterior division and all of these in pink are the posterior division. You can go through them themselves and basically memorize them. Uh, and um, there are some variations. That's something that you might, uh, that could be relevant, but again, not really. And uh, basically, it's one of the important things that you need to know is that the ovarian artery rises from the abdominal aorta. So this is a drawing basically of that, like, it's not only relevant to the pelvis and reproductive organs, that's quite relevant to abdomen as well. So basically that's supposed to be the abdominal aorta and these are all the levels of the spine and basically what arteries come up at each level. And that's quite helpful if you are able to memorize a diagram like that if you're a visual learner, to remember in clinical context what's gonna come from what. So here's there for you to use if you guys need, but here we can see that basically the gonadal arteries, which are gonna be like testicular or ovarian, are gonna be in between the renal artery and the superior rectal, uh, sorry, the IMA, sorry. So the venous drainage uh, is done from, uh, so basically um, there's the one thing that you guys need to remember is that the left gonadal artery, a vein, sorry, uh, so testicular or ovarian, directly uh, drains into the left renal vein and then into the IVC. Um, sorry, so it does a little bit of a loop and it can cause basically uh, not cracker syndrome if that left renal vein is uh, compressed. Um, they usually give you a, like a setting in which it's a male that has that um, pathology, but I've seen women having that in a wrong placement, so it can happen to anybody. In men, that can lead to varicocele. Um, so innervation, there's pretty much visceral, afferent, par and then efferent is gonna be parasympathetic and sympathetic. Now, it's been a while since I've done anatomy, so this is a little bit fuzzy, but pretty much what you need to know is that the splanchnic nerves are the parasympathetic innervation. Sympathetic trump and lumbar splanchnic nerves are the sympathetic efferent, and visceral efferents are subdivided in intraperitoneal and subperitoneal. Again, I don't think you necessarily need to know that, but that's pretty much the lumbar sacral plexus. Uh, that the clinical aspect of that is basically where are you gonna um, do an anesthesia for childbirth? So there's three that you can choose from. So the spinal block that is gonna anesthetize from the waist down, and then caudal epidural block, which basically is gonna anesthetize uh, some uh, somatic areas uh, that are innervated by the pudendal nerve and uh, subperitoneal um, structures, and then the pudendal nerve block, which has basically only uh, anesthetizes the sensory, uh, the, basically the external genitalia of both sexes and uh, all the perineum and surrounding structures, and motor pretty much the pelvic muscles. So here's another view uh, to make it a little bit clearer for you guys. So obviously um, important nerves in the area are, are also sciatic, obturator, and femoral, and those you should absolutely know, and especially know the root. Um, so pretty much here, um, we talk about also clinically what kind of symptoms you're going to see in a patient with specific nerve injuries. So femoral nerves, usually the patient will have some troubles basically sitting, uh, sorry, standing up from sitting and it can be caused by, you know, surgery. Basically the retractor could injure that a little bit. Uh, sciatic nerve is going to cause a little bit of a foot drop. Um, and iliolingual and iliohypogastric nerves is gonna give you pain and paresthesia in the upper thigh, mostly, and lower abdomen. Uh, genitofemoral nerve, pretty much, I, 
I didn't put it there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Chirated nerve is the um, basically you get painful spasms in your abduct adductor muscles and difficulty getting inside of a car because the movement that you do is this one. And another important thing to know is basically the neurovascular supply of the anal canal. This is not strictly a reproductive system, but I thought while we were in the area, we could do a little bit of a detour. This is really important that you know. So there's somatic up until here, the pectinate line, and visceral up. So that's really important. And also, structures for, uh, like superior to the pectinate line drain to different lymph nodes than the ones below the pectinate line. So that's something that will be quite important to know. Um, okay, perineum. Uh, so basically, the way that we can divide the perineum is basically in a uh, urogenital triangle, which is superior if the person is like lying down, and anal triangle, which is inferior if the person is like lying down with their legs open. So pretty much the anal triangle includes the anal aperture, so basically the anus, um, the external anal sphincter muscles, the pudendal nerve, and the, the lateral ischial fossa. And then your genital triangle is going to have the deep perineal pouch, so, um, and then perineal membrane, superficial perineal pouch, and then perineal fascia. The perineal fascia is quite important to know. Yeah, it's all those like layers of stuff that have many different names and that's quite important to know. We have a slide about it later. So basically the urogenital, urogenital triangle includes the deep and superficial uh, fascia. So the deep is continuous with the back fascia of penis in males and the superficial is continuous with the abdominal fascia, so the camper and scarpa, um, and then there's skin obviously. And the innervation is pudendal. And the pudendal nerve comes through the pudendal canal and it's derived from the obturator internus fascia. So those are the layers of the perineum. Again, not strictly reproductive, but those things overlap. It is very important that you know that because they do tend to ask questions about that. Um, so you've got skin, you've got the superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is gonna have fatty and fibrous layers. The fatty one is called camper. The fibrous one is called scarpa. Now, I do have my own mnemonics for that, but you, if you guys come up with your own, it's much, much better. Mine are in Italian, so I doubt that sharing them with you is going to be helpful at all. But if it helps, scarpa me chew in Italian, so do what you want with that. Um, and basically, those are continuous with collies, dartos, and, um, and superficial fascia with the genitals pretty much. And then obviously you've got external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdom abdominus, transversalis fascia, and the peritoneum. So the ones that I kind of talk to remember are those, but those are the ones that are important, understanding pretty much which ones go, goes where. Uh, this is a pretty good diagram, so if you are able to memorize that and uh, use mnemonics, that's really good. Okay, so that was the boring part. Every, anyone asleep yet or everyone good? Does anybody have any questions? No, okay. So, okay, so female reproductive anatomy. So one important thing to know basically before we even get into the uterus and everything else are the ligaments because I do like you to know about that. So we've got the mesometrium, which is basically the ligament that connects uh, the, pretty much these structures here the mesosalping, so remember that if it's salpin, it's going to be fallopian tubes and metrium is going to refer to the uterus. So that's what can help you remember that. So mesosalping is going to be like the um, mesenterium, but it's going to be the mesenterium of the salping, so the fallopian tubes. Mesometrium is for the uterus pretty much here, and then the mesovarium of the broad ligament. So basically that's what is connecting the ovaries. Yeah, all good. So other very important structures are obviously the ovarian ligament, round ligament, and we're going to go through them. So the round, um, here's the round ligament. I'm pretty sure that you guys maybe have the slides already, uh, if you had anatomy with like Lazarus and co, uh, but I thought it would be good to put them all in one place because these are very, very good images, and I would recommend learning from these. Um, so pretty much the important things that you need to know from this image is that the round ligament is here. Obviously, we've got are lovely fallopian tubes. Remember the difference between isthmus and polar and infundibulum. They like to ask where does fertilization occur? Can anyone say where? 
Yep. And this is what's up here. And obviously, it's always good to have a different view that gives you an understanding of where things are. They always like you uh, to know what the rectal uterine pouch is and the uh, basically vesicle uterine pouch or rectal vesicle pouch. They like all these like spaces and stuff. So the clinical relevance of the rectal uterine pouch is basically if you're uh, standing or even lying down, that's pretty much where all your fluids and that's not normal obviously you're not supposed to have fluid in your abdomen but if you have fluid in your abdomen for whatever reason so that can be infection or ascites or anything it can go it tends to go down here um pretty much the clinical significance is that in females what you can do is that if you if there's that fluid and you need to drain it or if there's an abscess in here and you need to drain it this so the posterior fornix is a handy little space to basically put a needle in and drain and that's called the synthesis. So that's the clinical relevance of that. Remember that the vesicle uterine pouch is not called vesicle uterine pouch in men just because they do not have a uterus usually. Um, so rectal ves vesicle pouch is what it's called in males. So the vascular, uh, vasculature of this, um, of the uterus is quite important. Uh, and the one thing that you always need to remember is that there's water under the bridge. So the uterine artery tends to go past superiorly to the ureter. And that's important because during like tubal ligation or other operations in the area, you wanna make sure that you're getting the right things. And you know, maybe you're touching the ureter and not touching the uterine artery because that's gonna be very messy. So you ligate the uterine artery just to make sure that that's there. No one is gonna touch it, everything is gonna be good. Okay. Also, fun fact, the uterus, if you kind of touch it, it just does this quiggly thing. Um, I think I said it in the next one, but pretty much it does this quiggly thing. So during an operation, that's how you're going to recognize it. Now, we've got pretty much the uh, uterus and vagina divided in three. So the part A is basically ovary, ovarian artery then supplying basically this part of the uterus and then and cervix pretty much. There's the uterine artery, then obviously the vagina is gonna be supplied by the vaginal artery. The middle rectal artery is going to go posteriorly to the vagina because we've, we've got the rectum posteriorly to the vagina, so that makes sense. And then internal pudendal artery basically innervating the external structures to the vagina, so the external genitalia. So, male <laughs> reproductive anatomy. <laughs> so, the main difference is, and that's important from a developmental view, and because we all know Lazarus, she likes to put a lot of embryological questions or embryological knowledge everywhere, uh, is basically that, I'm assuming you guys still have Lazarus, is that right? Yeah, okay. Um, so it's basically that in males, the urinary and reproductive tracts are combined, and in females it isn't. Um, so that's pretty much important. And then obviously that the gonads are external to the abdominal cavity and in female citizens. Also guys have a shorter, uh, longer urethra. So you guys are at less risk of UTIs just because of the distance. So uh, urine is gonna pretty much kill all bacteria with the flow. All right, so the gonads, as we mentioned, are outside of the uh, abdominal cavity. They're contained in the scrotum, which is this temperature sensitive musculus cutaneous pouch and um we've got one here and then the vast deference is what connects the testes to the urethra so that's the point of connection between your reproductive system and uh genital urinary urinary system so again important to be able to recognize all of these things so we've got the bulb here nice prostate and you can recognize that because it's right below the bladder and then the pubic synthesis. All right, again, because the layers of the peritoneum are so important, so are the layers of the scrotum, because that's pretty much an extension of that, if you know your embryology. So pretty much, um, you have to memorize this. Uh, it's just how it is, and it's sad, but it is like that. And so contents of the scrotum, testis, epididymis. Spermatic cord and darkless muscle, plus all the other fascias and structures that are in there. The vasculature, so basically the arterial su supply is from the anterior sc scrotal artery and posterior scrotal artery. Those are from internal pudendal artery. 
the venous drain drainage is from uh, scrotal veins and the lymphatics is superficial inguinal nodes. It is important that you know that testes and scrotum have a different lymphatic drainage because that means that if there's a cancer, those things are gonna metastasize at different points. So it is important to, that you guys know that the um, things are gonna metastasize differently. Um, the innervation is pretty much, uh, those are the innervations. So some of the perineal branches, some posterior femoral, cutaneous. So it's mostly sensory and then some autonomic. Now, importantly, it is important that you know what's the course of sperm and uh, the lifetime of sperm. So we start in the seminiferous tubule right here, then pretty much over here, and then it goes into the straight tubule. We go straight into this rete testis, rete means like web, and then you go up here at the end of epididymis, and then the journey continues. So the Arterial supply of testes is the testicular artery. So this is not too hard to remember. If you guess by the name, you're going right, probably in the reproductive system, which is good. And that's directly from the abdominal aorta. Venous drainage is from the testicular vein, which uh, are formed from the pampiniform plexus in scrotum. And that's important because it has, um, some people theorize that the left scrotum is lower than the right one because basically the pampiniform Pampiniform plexus drainage is basically makes it a little bit slower, so that's why it goes down and needs a little bit like cooler temperature. Now, vas deferens. It is important that you guys know what's the trip. So, what's where is it going? So, we're here at the testes in the epididymis. Basically, what it does is a big loop to go back outside again, right? So, we go all the way up here. We go back behind the urinary bladder right, in the seminal vesicle, and then you go all the way down just to reconnect with the urethra at the level of the prostate, pretty much, and then back out. So just remember pretty much what's the point where the uh, vas, basically the reproductive system reconnects with the urinary, and that's pretty much here, posteriorly to the bladder. Now the prostate, we've got, these are the different zones, so transitional, peripheral, We've got the central and the interior. Um, it's important that you basically know what are the lymphatics and venous drainage, because again, that relates to the um, metastases and where everything goes. So basically, metastases or, or like spread of cancer can go through like venous drainage. So either through the internal iliac veins, common iliac veins, and then who knows where from there. And then Basically, it can actually go directly into the brain because connection with the internal vertebral venous plexus leads them to go to the brain. And then lymphatically, they usually tend to spread to the iliac, internal iliac nodes and, and that basically if there's further spread is going to spread to common iliac nodes and then lumbar nodes. So that's where you're going to find it. So it's going to be a little bit deeper as opposed to like superficial nodes. And obviously, spread can be other than just like lymphatic and hematogenous. So obviously, there's local and perineal. All right. So, uh, and another thing is that unfortunately, because there is close proximity between the neurovascular bundle and uh, um, periprostatic nerve plexus, ooh, ah, okay, uh, radical prostatectomy can hit these nerves and basically cause erectile dysfunction. Okay. So... Urethra, you should know the different type, types, uh, different sections of urethra. So pretty much we've got the prostatic, there's a pre-prostatic technically, then there's a prostatic, membranous, bulbous, and pendula. And bulbous and pendula are part of your spongy urethra. It is right here in the interme intermediate part of the membranous urethra that it's usually hard to pass the catheter through. So that's, a, that's why when you, do a, when you perform a catheter, catheterization, you want to make sure that the penis is at 90 degrees so that that angle doesn't basically uh, in, like, uh, hinder the catheterization because that's where it can get stuck and that's not good. All right. Um, this is always like a fun picture. Uh, so <laughs> here's the anatomy of the erectile uh, structures of the penis. 
So this is quite good at understanding where the neurovasculature of uh, the shaft go and the deep artery, I think, is um, an important one. Remember the uh, corpora cavernosa versus the gland and the corpus sanjosum, and then the perineal body, uh, and then obviously all the anatomy of the of the pupils. Okay, so um, erectile dysfunction can happen for a bunch of reasons. Sometimes it can be for arterial insufficiency. So it can be atherosclerosis. So literally the same thing that will give you angina can give you erectile dysfunction because blood is not getting there. The way that erection works, if um, uh, the neurologist lecture didn't talk about it enough, is that basically uh, the deep artery supplies the lacuna of the corpus cavernosa, blood builds up, and then the dorsal vein, the dorsal vein basically is like cut off by pressure. So no blood is leaving the area. So basically because blood is trapped, the erection is maintained. So if there's an arterial insufficiency, that's going to be a little bit harder. Um, so usually a, lo a lot of the times erectile dysfunction is gonna be one of the first signs that uh, your patient is a vasculopath, which is basically someone that has, you know, fucked up arteries. Um, whoops. And uh, basically the way that you can deal with that is um, sildenafil, which basically will, uh, um, it's like a muscle relaxant of the smooth muscles of the artery, so it will basically vasodilate. Make sure to never, never combine uh, like Viagra or so sildenafil and uh, uh, nitrate because that can cause too much dilation of the arteries and that's that. Obviously, to reduce testosterone, and that can be from a central cause, so CNS and endocrine can also cause erectile dysfunction. Now, embryology. Uh, so we're going to skip through it really quickly, but basically this lecture was given a while ago about, uh, so last year about embryology, and we're going to skip them, through them really quickly. But pretty much the things you need to know is there, there's a mesonephric duct and a paramesonephric duct. In, uh, and the, way, the reason why it's important is because those combine or one of the structures disappears to, com to basically either combine the um, reproductive and renal system, or sorry, reproductive and uh, urinary system or not. So this part of the external genitalia um, development is common to both sexes. So at this stage, they're both the same thing. This is where things change. So basically in males, these structures are going to elongate and this area is going to close in female citizens, and this is not going to elongate. That's pretty much the difference. Obviously, if you want more in detail slides, those are it. And here is a little bit of a summary of what happens. So basically, let's divide the development into internal and external genitalia. When it comes to internal genitalia, you've got somatic cells around the stolimic epithelium and mesonephrus that surround these germ cells that are there. Basically, the paramesonephric ducts that we've talked about develop near the mesonephric ducts basically um, prostate, seminal vesicle, and all these things develop in males. Uh, and the somatic cells for, form the testic, testis cords and the seminiferous tubules. And the mesonephric tubules become the vas deferentia. In females, uh, the somatic cells surround what's going to form primordial fo follicles, and we're going to get into what those are soon. And the mesonephric ducts and... Um, and paramesonephric ducts become fallopian tubes, uterus, and superior vagina. So that's pretty much the difference. Um, okay, and then pretty much external genitalia, they differentiate. Um, there's a shortening of the gubernaculum that basically brings the testes to the corresponding uh, part, and basically that's how the testes go into the scrotum, and the paramesonephric duct joins uh, to the external genitalia to form the uh, uterus and vagina. And this is a handy drawing of what it actually means. So those are the steps and those are the corresponding drawings. I don't want to talk about embryology anymore, but if you have any questions, please ask. But, okay, histology. So this histology is going to be histology and a little bit of path, uh, physiology, just because it's useful to mix them. So on a slide, you should be able to recognize the seminiferous tubule just because they look like brown and like they have a hole in it. So it looks like a tube. So have a guess, it's gonna be a seminiferous tubule. And what's in, in the tubes is gonna be intertubular tubular tissue. So that's pretty simple. 
the and then basically just remember that um, this is lined by complex stratified epithelium. They contain Sertoli cells, which are really important. And basically, um, this external part is uh, lamina propria, is made of basal lamina and myofibroblasts, which basically is myo is muscle, so it gives it contractile proper properties. So, so basically, can contract. Um, the peritubular functions, the tissue functions, so the tissue that is like just around the tubules, um, have the function to propel spermatozoa towards vas deferens, so that's why we've got those myofibroblasts, structural support, and then androgen receptors, because we know that Sertoli cells have those receptors that are actually, like the sperm cells do not have any receptors, it's the Sertoli cells that have the receptors that initiate spermatogenesis, so that's why we've got the androgen receptors. So talking and speaking of the devil, we've got Sertoli cells right here. Here's a nucleus. And then, for example, this is another nucleus. And this is the entire Sertoli cell. It's really hard to tell each cell apart because the plasma membranes are actually, there's a lot of structures that basically connect them. So all these like tight junctions, desmosomes, gap junctions that make them really close together. And they form the blood tested barrier. So like the blood brain barrier, but down there. And basically columnar cells are basically what these are made out of um and then there's these lateral processes as i mentioned so the germ cells are not inside the sertoli cells i was really confused about that in second year uh they're just like supported by them so they're just like kind of here i mean they come from okay so the functions of sertoli cells is S uh, sex determination so expression of S sry Developmental, so the anti-Mullerian hormone production. Hormonal regulation, as I mentioned, they have the receptors for testosterone, so that initiates um, spermatogenesis. And stem cell regulation, so basically they self-renew their own stem cells, they self-provide their own stem cells. And then obviously the blood uh, barrier, blood tested barrier. Now, in between the tubules, we've got that intertubular tissue, whose main, the protagonists of the intertubular tissue are the Leydig cells. They are those that produce the testosterone and, um, and basically initiate steroidogenesis, uh, initiate eventually spermatogenesis through, through the production of androgen. So what happens is that, so we've got them here and they've got little crystals inside them. So that's how you recognize them. The way it works is that your hypothalamus is going to release uh, LH and FSH. FSH is going to go straight to the Sertoli cells and then the Sertoli cells are going to probably release some more things that are going to um, basically stimulate the Leydig cells. But LH goes directly to the Leydig cells which at that point produce testosterone. Testosterone helps germ cells to become spermato uh, spermatozoa and also go, goes elsewhere. So this testosterone is going to help with the external genitalia development and so on and so forth. Now, spermatogenesis. So this is how it happens. We've got the classic meiosis, which I'm not gonna go too much in depth in because I assume that most of you guys know, but pretty much what happens is that we start with a diploid cell and we end with a haploid cell. Right, so this is what happens, and that's where it happens. So it starts basically at the base of the Sertoli cell, so right here. And so here's where we've got the like prim primary ones. And then slowly they develop and they go towards the outside. And they are in this fluid, basically, that helps them and nourishes them and makes sure that they're, they're okay. Um, so here we can basically see how there's like mitosis happening at metaphase, right? Because they're all in the middle. Now, um, here's another picture of basically what things are what, and they might ask you to recognize what particular cells they are. So obviously, the ones that are at the bottom, they're going to be the first ones. So spermatogonium, right at the bottom, you don't even need to actually recognize what it is. You just know that it's the first one to appear. The spermatocyte is like double the size of the first one. So that's how you recognize it. And the third one, the round spermatid, it kind of looks similar, but it is really a different color. It's like more whitish. So that's how you recognize it. And then the elongated sperm is going to be far up above, like here. 
all of the cells that are being produced, basically, usually there's cytokinesis that basically separates the cells. That's not happening in spermatogenesis. So the syncytium forms, and they're going to be like that for a while. Okay, and then maturation of the sperm happens, and basically the most important stuff is that they have a lot of mitochondria because they're busy boys and they have to get places and they need a lot of energy, so they need a lot of mitochondria. Then they've got this acrosomal vesicle, which basically has enzymes. They need to penetrate that um, zona pellucida, so they need a lot of like stuff to get through it. Those are the, their weapons. They've got a nucleus and not much else. Actually, like the egg cells have everything else. They actually have double the cytoplasm, double the like uh, structures. And that's because the sperm is really not bringing much to the picture. So the egg needs to do the thing on its own. So um, it's actually the eggs are the biggest cell in the body. Uh, and that's again, because the, it's not practical for the sperm to carry all those organelles if they're not going to use it. Their main purpose are to move and to break the zona pellucida. And that's, the, and that's why they're going to have mitochondria acrosomal vesicle, and the tail. Now, they mature pretty much in the, in, the, in the male reproductive system, but they will not gain full motility until they're in the female um, reproductive system. That's where they gain like hyper motile motility, I think. Uh, it'll come up soon. But pretty much that's what happens. So that's the maturation. Now we've got uh, epididymis. So once it's ready, it's like basically at the edge of the Sertoli, Sertoli cells, it's ready to go. It goes into the epididymis. So the, uh, this is made of pseudostratified epithelium, uh, peritubular smooth muscle, because we need it to basically move everything along, and ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and that's because it aids with the movement. Serious cilia are also there, but they're non-motile. So those do not have motile function. Um, again, as I mentioned, they gain final motility in the female reproductive tract. So it, this is like a very, very beautiful slide. And I think there's nothing else that looks like that in the body. So once you have learned to recognize that this is the epididymis, you can't get it wrong. There's nothing else that looks like it. Now the vas deferens has, again, surprise, surprise, sort of stratified columnar epithelium and uh, has highly folded and rigid lamina propria and a lot of smooth muscle. It needs to get things across. It secretes this yellow fluid that is high in proteins and prostaglandins. And basically, it helps move the sperm through the ejaculatory tract. Um, through and, uh, and basically, this, the role of the stereocilia, which sounded like they were gonna help things move, but they actually don't, is to absorb a lot of the debris to recycle. So they're environment friendly. And uh, the cool thing about this is that when a man has a vasectomy, because um, basically that's where the sperm is absorbed. Okay. Um, so the prostate, we can recognize the domes here. Um, it's made mostly of glandular tissue. The important thing that will help you recognize it in, in an exam is that it doesn't have you know, pseudostratified, whatever, epithelium, it's really heterogeneous. So it has a little bit of everything. So that will help you memorize that. And it secretes this watery liquid, which is made of zinc, citric acid, prostaglandins, PSA, which is also a marker that we, help with, that we use to um, screen for prostate cancer, and proteolytic enzymes. And testosterone stimulates its growth. And that's why over time, uh, men, uh, uh, like with age, men will have a hyperplasia of the, of the prostate. That will just happen with age because of testosterone, pretty much. Okay, female reproductive system. We've got the ovarian, we start with the ovarian cycle and then we'll go to the uterine cycle. So we've got all these phases. And we're just going to go through them step by step. If there's anything that doesn't match or something you don't understand, please interrupt me. So we start with the primordial follicle, and that's pretty simple. It's just the oocyte and the layer of granulosa outside. So each moment from puberty to menopause, these are gonna be recruited and activated. And during activation, these granulosa cells are gonna to start to proliferate and become cuboidal. The oocyte becomes a little bit bigger and the zona pellucida forms. So it goes from primordial, it's promoted to primary follicle that has granulosa cells around uh, that keep prolifer proliferating and now instead than just one layer is going to be more. 
The secondary follicle, it, you, it, you differentiate it because it has theca cells, which produce estrogen. Uh, it also produces uh, granulosa cells. And um, yeah, pretty much they produce this fluid. So this fluid that is released from the theca cells produces antrum, which is here. You can see that. This kind of space that is created by the fluid. And uh, this antrum um, basically will keep growing throughout the entire cycle. So there's going to be, at the beginning of a cycle, 10 to 25 uh, preantral follicles. Only one will be selected. So the process of elimination is not normal apoptosis. That's going to be atresia. So the dominant follicle that wins uh, will get to have ovulation. Uh, pretty much so the, uh, it, the antrum of that dominant follicle will keep expanding continuously until it's so big it bursts. And that's what happens with, uh, with um, ovulation. So the mature follicle is going to have an oocyte, which is right here, surrounded by a capsule. And basically it projects into the atrium. This projection is called cumulus of ores. So this is a more simplified picture if you don't like histology. Um, so at this stage, this is over. We've got a mature follicle. Now, um, the oocyte finally finishes the first mitotic division. Because as we know, women have oocytes um, in their uh, eggs from like birth and even before. They keep like we get less and less and less and less over time, but they are all arrested at prophylax one. So they haven't completed their first mitosis. Finally, I'm sorry, my, no, meiosis. Yeah, so the meiosis, so I'll have to change that. So basically meiosis continues finally, and it goes on. So, um, and finally, it becomes like a little bit bigger. So when the wall of the follicle rupture, and LH is an important hormone that does that, um, there will be a surge at that point, and that's what's going to cause the follicle to break. Ovula ovulation occurs. And the secondary oocyte, which has now become secondary, uh, will be released into the peritoneal cavity. And you're like, oh my god, I'm lost. No because we've got the follicular fluid that was right there that basically will help transport and nutrition and will keep it safe. And then the fimbria of the fallopian tubes will take it to where it needs to be and be ready for fertilization. So now all of this has happened. We've gone through a long trip. Now, if, if, it is for, if it's not fertilized, what happens is that basically the enlarged granulosa cells that are left behind in the, in the, in the ovary, are basically, um, and the theca cells, become the corpus luteum. So basically the oocyte has left. All the fluid has left. What's left is the granulosa cells and the theca cells, and they form what's going to be the corpus luteus, luteum. And that's important because it produces progesterone and estrogen. And until implantation happens, and until a placenta is gonna come by, progesterone and estrogen produced by the corpus luteum is actually gonna keep the walls of your uterus well enough to sustain pregnancy. Now, if there's no fertilization, the corpus luteum would just degrade in 10 days. And therefore, if it degrades, there's no more hormonal output. So if there's no progesterone and estrogen to keep things going, the endometrium will just go away. And that's what menstruation is. So basically, there's no more estrogen and progesterone that are supplying that uh, uterine wall. And therefore, the corpus luteum becomes the corpus albicans. So I think the way that you can remember that is that um, someone who's like um, albino is like really white. That's because like alb albicans in Latin means white. So that's why this looks very white. Um, if fertilization happens, the corpus luteum, as I, as I mentioned, persists until the placenta forms and that's at about three months. And that's it. Now, it is important that you guys know your hormones. So basically what's gonna happen and when, and these are handy little graphs, but pretty much LH is gonna be the same all the time and until like eight to nine hours before ovulation. And that's what drives ovulation. So that's all you need to know about LH in, in the ovarian cycles. And FSH pretty much increases all the time because obviously it's being produced by the follicles and then kind of goes down. 
Estrogen and progesterone also change. So estrogen is going to produce by the follicle at the beginning, then it's going to go down when there's going to be ovulation and then up again because it's being produced by the corpus luteum. And then the progesterone goes all the way up just before ovulation. And then um, when it's, sorry, when it's produced by the corpus luteum, it really peaks. And then when it's the greater, it goes down. Now, inhibin A and B are produced by cells in the follicle. So A is produced by the large follicles and, um, and corpus luteum. So basically, it's going to be produced towards ovulation and when the corpus luteum is there hanging out. And then inhibin B is produced by the granulosa cells. So when the follicles are growing, it's going well. Then ovulation happens and there's a surge and then pretty much it just ends because the granulosa cells are just not doing anything anymore. Okay, cool. Now, those things obviously uh, have an effect on the uterine cycle. So the uterine cycle is the effect of what's happening in your ovaries. So the endometrium and the myometrium and the perimetrium are just basically layers of your uterus. But the important one that we really care about is the endometrium. The endometrium can be also divided in two, which is the stratum functionalis and basalis. So functional layer and basal layer. The functional layer is the one that is replaced all the time. It just keeps changing every cycle. Every cycle it's just replaced. And it's made of columnar epithelium and connective tissue stroma. The basalis, so the basal layer, it's always there. It's the portion that it is kept after menstruation and basically is unresponsive to ovarian hormones. So that's just gonna stick by. So you can see how there's three different phases of the uterine cycle, and that's the menstrual phase, proliferative phase, and secretory phase. So we're starting basically after the corpus luteum has degenerated and we don't have any progesterone and estrogen available. So what's happening is that um, basically this is all shedding off. Once that's gone, basically your uterus is gonna get ready to have babies one more time. So that's why it's proliferative because it's going to give you glycogen and all this nutritious stuff and then all these arteries that basically are gonna to supply the uh, uterine wall. Then ovulation happens and there's going to be a phase of secretor, um, secretory phase, which is like they are like, going for it like they're really secreting all they can because they really want to support this little embryo and they're doing their best job and then if there's no fertilization they realize it's useless and throw it all away so the secretory phase it's the uterus throwing a potty for the embryo that's coming and then no one is coming and they throw everything now so let's go a little bit more into detail so the menstrual phase is from day one to five for some women it's a little bit longer so what's going to happen is that the thick functional layer that we just mentioned before is going to detach completely and is lost through vaginal bleeding. Um, and it's triggered by the low estrogen and progesterone that are not being produced by the corpus luteum. I know I'm saying the same things all over again, but it's going to stick to your brain. You're going to dream about it. And then basically the constriction of uterine blood vessels um, and the contraction of the smooth mu muscles is going to cause the menstrual cramps in some women. So this is obviously mediated by prostaglandins and that are there because there's no estrogen and progesterone. Now, because there's no oxygen, there's no nutrients, there's nothing going on, basically there's going to be ischemia of this functional layer and this ischemia is gonna cause all this layer to just like slough off because it's dead and basically just being lost through vaginal bleeding. At this point, we've got the proliferative phase which is pre-ovulatory phase that is also how we can call it, from, day, from basically the day that the period finishes to ovulation. Here, there's a rebuilding. So we're rebuilding that functional layer. Slowly, the progesterone and estrogen are increasing, um, and especially estrogen, which is being produced by the follicles, increases the amount of progesterone receptors in the endometrium. So even though there's not a whole lot of progesterone because the corpus luteum is not there yet, basically by putting more receptors on the endometrium, the <coughs> uterus is automatically more receptive to the progesterone that is around. And then there's also thinning of the cervical mucus, which basically makes it easier for sperm to get where it needs to get. Now, the secretory phase, which is from ovulation onwards, is when the progesterone levels rise, 
uh, and basically the, the uterus is preparing the endometrium for implantation. So again, as I mentioned before, there's gonna be more stroma, arteries, glycogen to nourish the embryo, and then it wants to prevent myometrial contraction. So the myometrium is this muscular layer here. We want to protect, prevent those contractions, which are also the contractions which usually help you give birth. So to prevent that, um, that's basically everything that's happening. If fertilization is not occurring, the LH levels will fall, the generational corpus luteum, and decreased progesterone, so you keep looping. Uh, so we're talking about straight after the ovulation. So that's from the corpus luteum that is forming again. The which phase? So the progesterone is actually the same. What the estrogen is doing is that estrogen is going to cause the uterus to have more receptors. And so even though the progesterone is kind of the same, the fact that the, the uterus is more receptive means that there are going to be increased effects of progesterone despite the concentration being the same. Okay, now physiology. So fertilization is something that um, I think they gave just one lecture, so don't stress too much about it, but just know the basics. So know that there is an, uh, basically the sperm uh, has go undergoes capacitation in the female reproductive tract. So it has hyperactivated mobility, that's the word, and uh, basically that allows the acrosome uh, the reaction. So basically uh, the sperm can bind to the zona pellucida and increase the intracellular calcium. That's a really important tri trigger because it allows basically the, fun the fusion of the plasma of both cells and therefore the acrosomal enzyme release. Once the zona pellucida has been uh, penetrated, um, the enzymes from the acrosome, um, basically, and, and obviously the hyperactive tail, um, cause it to go deep forward, uh, like further in. And then there's proteins in the zona pellucida, which basically either induce the acrosome pr production, and that's ZP, ZP3, or uh, basically binds to the acrosome rea like reactive sperm, so ZP3. Those two pro uh, proteins we'll find also later allow us to only have one sperm and not many. So once the, um, basically, basically at that point, we just want those membrane to fuse and that happens through these proteins, CP9 for the egg and Izumo from, for uh, the sperm. At that point, um, there's this exocytosis, I think endocytosis, uh, triggered by post-infusion increase. So there's more calcium that causes the cell to basically absorb whatever is happening uh, in like all the contents of the sperm. And at that point, the calcium also makes sure that ZP, ZP2 and ZP3 are cleaved. So they're not doing their job any longer. They're not facilitating sperm to get in. And so only one sperm can get in there. And then finally, after that, the cell cycle return, like uh, is just happens again. And that's increased by the intracellular calcium. At that point, we've got a little zygote, which goes through all the stages that you've gone through like last year as well with embryology. Um, basically, what's causing, um, what causes the th uh, trophoblast at this stage to implant in the placenta are integrins. So this integrins protein make the trophoblast attach to the endo endometrium and the synctuo trophoblast basically invades uh, uh, all the and digest the endometrium. So that's how it implants. So successful implantation takes 12 to 14 days from fertilization to occur. Oh my god, so many spelling mistakes. I'm so sorry. Um, from 12 to 14 days um, and basically the embryo produces HCG to keep the corpus luteum going and that basically allows for the uterine walls to be still thick and strong and nutritious and so it can still implant. And then at eight weeks or three months, it really depends, the placenta takes over. So these are some clinical um, things that you, you know, that you can encounter if that process doesn't go very well. So ectopic pregnancy if, is if basically the implantation occurs anywhere that isn't here. 
and then placenta, pre placenta previa. I don't think that's super relevant for you guys, but pretty much the placenta may cover the vagina because the blastocyst is implanting near the opening of the cervix. So that's a little bit of an inconvenient. But ectopic pregnancy, especially if ruptured, can be a medical emergency. I don't exactly know about placenta previa. Now, placentation. The important thing about placenta is that it, it transports a lot of stuff. And different things will be transported differently. So there's all the types of transport. We've got the passive, facilitated, active, and endocytosis. You don't necessarily have to memorize what goes in through what and how, but pretty much the way to remember is that the smaller is a molecule, the easier it's going to be to let it through. And obviously, whether it's going to be lipophilic or, lipo, or sorry, hydrophilic or hydrophobic, that also help facilitates or makes it harder for the molecule to get through. So just think about it a second. Is this a big, like, is this like a huge amino acid or is this like a whole chunk of like lipids? So if those things will need a little bit more effort to get in, but if it's water, water will get in really easily, just passively. Um, another important thing is that the placenta is actually permeable to alcohol, nicotine and drugs. So obviously prenatal care is really important. And, uh, it is impermeable to large proteins. So there's no blood exchange in between the, the two. Now, um, placenta also helps with waste removal, immunological barriers, so it helps basically keep the baby safe, and synthesis of hormones. So progesterone is a big one, um, estrogen also as well, and then there's prostaglandin and many, many others that you probably can go a little bit more in detail. Um, this is how the progesterone basically, no, sorry, yes, how the progesterone basically behaves. Um, these are the different, um, with how does the placenta develop? Feel free to dive into this at your own time if you want. Now, parturition, not a whole lot that we need to know, but it's pretty much this positive feedback of oxytocin. I'm not going to go too much in depth with it, but basically the contractions are basically going to, like the stretching of the, um, basically the birth canal is going to send a signal to the aquathalamus, which produces, um, which it sends a signal to the uh, posterior pituitary that is going to release the oxytocin. The oxytocin is going to go to basically induce more contractions and the cycle goes on. The more contractions, the more oxytocin and that causes more contractions and so on and so forth. So these are basically the stages. So the cervix relaxes, <clears throat> there's more uterine contractions and then finally the baby is delivered and then the placenta needs to be expelled. Um, Factors that include, uh, that basically induce contractions are prostaglandins, pretty much, that act on the myometrium, which is the thing that we were talking about earlier, the muscular layer of the uterus. Lactation happens, uh, still, like, it's basically guided hormonally. As the baby is suckling, to, uh, it stimulates the nerve uh, endings of the areola, um, which basically sends signals to the hypothalamus hypothalamus sends signal to the posterior pituitary gland to release oxytocin and that basically contracts all the muscle walls of the alveoli in, uh, in the breast to release milk during feeding. And at the same time, the anterior pituitary is producing prolactin, which stimulates the alveoli to produce breast milk. So prolactin was inhibited by progesterone and estrogen during pregnancy. Once those are gone, because the baby is now born, we don't need to keep the endometrium any thicker and healthy. Basically, we just, um, those are gone, so prolactin can finally go off and breast is produced. At the beginning, the colostrum is produced, and then finally it becomes milk. So two to three days after, it's really great milk that the baby can feed off. So quickly through puberty, so kiss. Peptin um, is what causes FSH and LH rise. It's a basically pulsatile fashion uh, of a GnRH, uh, and it's a night. So that's what triggers puberty. And sexual response, just remember point and shoot. So P for parasympathetic, shoot for sympathetic. And this is pretty much what's going on. Now menopause. Uh, we've got all these stages of menopause. So menopause, which is basically finally when um, a woman just does not have period anymore and it has the last period. 
uh, and hasn't had a hysterectomy. Perimenopause is the time from the onset of cycle irregularity until the last menstrual period. The menopause transition is from the, hmm, sounds like the same, okay. And then surgical menopause is the removal of both ovaries. And these are the various symptoms of menopause and you can go through these in your own time. But those are you know, things that, like for example, the hot flashes, the um, drying of the vaginal mucosa, and so that can cause dyspareunia, and then um, increased UTIs, um, and so much more, increased osteoporosis and cardiovascular and metabolic syndrome disease. And then obviously, uh, an there's a change in how the adipose tissue is distributed, so they don't gain weight, but the tissue is the, the adipose tissue starts to be distributed differently because of low estrogen. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is a handy table of all the organisms that can cause STI. Um, so HPV usually causes like warts, but if it's like 16 or 18, they can be basically cervical, anal, and vulvar penile cancers. Uh, so vaccines are good. Uh, they don't do pap smears anymore. It's actually cytology now. Um, uh, HIV. Uh, I don't know how much you need to know about this, but pretty much just remember that antiretroviral therapy uh, is great. Uh, basically, as of now, with like prophylactic therapy and antiretroviral therapy, the quality of life and uh, um, basically life expectancy barely changes. So that's great. Um, and then genital herpes. Chlamy and then those are the viral ones and these are the bacterial ones. So the bacterial ones are chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Just try to memorize which ones um, uh, are treated by what. Usually azithromycin is a safe option in terms of STIs. Um, and uh, sometimes there's plus or minus another one. Um, and syphilis, it's really easily treatable with uh, penicillin. Now, contraception, because that's relevant for OSCEs. I know that you guys have a table on your clinical skills uh, uh, workbook, so I thought I'd go through it with you guys, just so, um, just so you know. Basically, here's the ones that are most common. So we've got the combined oral contraceptive pill. It's really easy to take, it's not invasive. You take it once a day, you try to make, it, make sure that it's at the same time every day for maximum efficacy. Um, and it gives you shorter periods, gets rid of your acne. So that's some good things. Unfortunately, it has a wide range of side effects, which people experience totally different. So that really depends on your patient. Um, some people may just feel sick. Sometimes there's some um, bleeding in between the periods, especially at the beginning. Um, headaches, bloating, and mood swings. Um, and obviously, always, always, always mention that these things do not protect you from STIs. Um, obviously, you do not want to give a co um, combined oral contraceptive pill to someone with migraines because someone with aura migraines, is, this is just going to make it really worse. So you don't want to make that any worse than it is. For those people, you use progesterone-only pills. So for people with migraines, people that are really overweight, over 35, smokers, usually go on the mini pill. And the mini pill is pretty much similar in terms of like how you take it, um, and also in terms of like effectiveness. Um, but it has a little bit of a like shorter window. So you have to take it within three hours of the time they usually take it in. Um, the implanon is just this thing that you put in your arm. Okay, just if the implanon is just in your arm. Neuring is a ring. Three, every three weeks you change it if you want your period. The injection is basically the, um, you just have an injection every 12 weeks. IUD, there's copper and hormonal. Copper just uh, is permicide and hormonal and just has the same effect as all the other contraceptive uh, pills. Uh, and it lasts five to 10 years. Male condom, I'm guessing you all know what it is. Uh, female condom, I mean, no one uses it. Uh, the, the diaphragm is a little bit outdated. No one recommends it really anymore. Natural family planning, good luck. Um, and then basically sterilization, so tubal ligation and vasectomy. Uh, and then obviously the plan B pill. So here's everything.
Thank you.